appreciate you uh, taking the time and listening now to this message. This is a message, not a devotion. So uh, it's, uh, I need you to hang in there with me. Uh, today is a message that I've entitled, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Now what? And over a week ago, I felt uh, impressed to, to bring forth this message and to look at the simple truths of what it means to really follow Jesus. Uh, you know, the message of Jesus spoke, the parable, the story of the sower and the seed. Um, it talks about different responses given by uh, the human race towards his simple message, the good news. Uh, there'll be those that hear the message, they'll, they'll hear it, and they will reject it outright. And they will go on as if it didn't even affect them. And then there will be those, Jesus said, that will receive the word of truth. Uh, yet when trouble arises because of their newfound decision to follow Jesus, uh, the, the life that they've been living following the Lord will, will just slowly fade off, fade away or disappear or, or just simply fall away. Uh, they didn't endure. And then Jesus said the third types of uh, response is those that hear the truths of God, the word. Uh, they, they hear it with joy, I'm sure. They cherish and receive these eternal truths of God. But when the cares and desires of the world, you know, crop up over time around them in their life, uh, their priorities start to shift. What once was God first, seeking first the kingdom of God, now has been replaced with, you know, careers or family or, or uh, you know, whatever else this life throws at us that tends to uh, keep us occupied and busy. And so these people either just camp out where they're at. They don't really grow anymore as spiritually. Uh, they, they do believe they have their ticket to heaven, that when they die, they're going to be uh, with God uh, no matter what. But they end up living out the rest of the days of their life very fruitless, uh, void of obedience to those same eternal truths that they accepted in the beginning. They left their first love, and they have fallen from their first love. And then Jesus said the fourth type of response that uh, people will give when they hear the truths of God is that they will hear the truths and with joy receive them, and then they will uh, live humbly before God, always waking up every day, with simple trust, simple faith, sincere faith, learning and growing and being um, faithful in what little God has given them for that day. Unfortunately, the track record of Christianity as a whole is, is not a good one, according to this story, this parable that Jesus spoke. Of course, I have the terrible responsibility to remind you of these things as an overseer of the Church of Jesus Christ. So all my messages, including this one, are, are first for me, and then I pass them on and, and give them to you. It is my responsibility to remind you of these things so that you don't get lulled into a state of sleep as you pursue to follow Jesus for all it's worth. So we're first going to start with the words of Jesus now in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, in chapter 7, 
starting in verses 13 through 29. I want you to listen. If you obviously you can follow along in your Bible with me. If you don't have a Bible with you and you're listening to this, uh, listen carefully to these words of Jesus himself as he takes his disciples and separates them from the crowds of people and sets down with them and uh, and speaks these truths these these eternal truths that will provide these disciples life lasting life real life god's kind of life the kind of life god meant for man to have from the very beginning so listen carefully and and also I'm going to be saying today and going over a lot of things in the scriptures that you simply are not going to want to hear. It's just not a pretty message by and large, though it is a truthful message. So you're going to have to really listen to this and be sincere about it or just press delete and and move on because... uh, by the end of this message, you will see how serious it is to say that I am following Jesus, that I have decided to follow Jesus. Uh, no turning back. So Jesus says, starting in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse, verses 13 through 29, he goes, enter God's life. Enter by the narrow gate, not a narrow gate, but the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and and there's many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, God's kind of life. And Jesus said, there are few who find it. Beware, he says, of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, but nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every single tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, By their fruits, you will know them. Now, not everyone who says to me, Jesus said, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, and he's talking about the great day of judgment. Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. So depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And Jesus goes on to say, Therefore, whoever hears these teachings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rain descended, and the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And then Matthew closes out that those sayings with this. And so it was, Matthew says, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Let me say something about that last statement that Matthew brought out, that Jesus taught the people as one who had authority and not as the scribes. You know, the, the, the vast majority of the crowds and the vast majority of the disciples uh, that followed Jesus, that believed in him, not just the 12, but those that believed, they were mostly made up of Jewish people who participated and knew Israel's religious system very well. They had heard a lot of teachings uh, from the law of Moses and the Torah, the Torah and the, the prophets and the wisdom books and from many different rabbis and teachers. You know, and Jewish scholars in those days often taught the scriptures or the law of God and the prophets by presenting a multiple viewpoints on any given subject. And they might point to different rabbis who believe a certain way, who have different views. And so, as a whole, kind of like today, you have so many different preachers and teachers out there on, on television, radio, and, 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 and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of churches worldwide with different views. They end up having to leave it to the listener to decide which is the truth, which is closer to the truth. But here, what Matthew is saying is, this was not the approach of Jesus. Now, let me say that again. Jesus' approach to teaching the eternal truths of the Father was not in the same way and authority that the Jewish scholars of his day taught. Jesus taught with authority, the only authority. Jesus stated clearly, even bluntly, what was true and what was false. There was no gray area in what Jesus taught. Why? Because he was God. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the divine Son of God, God the Son, born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit of God. He lived a life without missing the mark of God's truth, and he became the only perfect Lamb of God without blemish that could satisfy the justice of Almighty God for the sins of the whole world. So, yes, Jesus possessed an authority that the scribes, the scholars, the rabbis did not have. The authority to call out truth, to call out sin and falsehood, and even call out the religious leaders of his day. Jesus did not build his arguments on the basis of what other people are saying or rely on their reputations. Jesus spoke as the one begotten Son of God who had first hand, personal, absolute knowledge of the eternal truths that have been around before the foundations of the world. Jesus even stated, I am the truth. Now, by nature, 
we humans do not respond well to real truth, even though that's what we claim we are seeking. You know, we'll go to great lengths to know truth, or what we call truth, but if it goes against our personal desires and our agenda, then we can easily reject it. You know, if, if we were honest, and I mean ruthlessly honest, we would readily admit that we are really seeking satisfaction and happiness in life, in this life on this round planet, much more than we're seeking real truth. And we also, as humans, are under the assumption that once we think we have found truth, that it's going to make our life easier. And if it doesn't make our life easier, then we're not going to accept it as truth. And we'll continue our search until our feelings and our desires are satisfied. You know, Jesus spent over three years speaking nothing but real, authentic, honest, sincere, simple truth that has been established from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus spoke truth to thousands upon thousands of people over the, his ministry, the lifespan of his ministry, and yet ended up his earthly life with a little over 100 people who believed him and stuck with him till the end. That tells us something. That tells us that we're really not seeking truth, at least truth that we put our stamp of approval on. So, don't think that God's going to be surprised if some of you walk out of this message today, you turn me off, and you continue practicing the very things that goes against the truth you've heard and that you know and that you understand concerning the will of God for human life. Because God has given us choices. We can't, we can't surprise him. He knows full well that the majority of humans on planet Earth throughout the ages will take their choice and they'll vote against his truth. But he just wants us to understand something. He wants us to understand something in the clearest terms, that when we live by his truth, or if we reject his truth, there will always be consequences. So we start off reading the words, the sayings, the teachings of Jesus as he makes crystal clear to the people and to us that in, in our search for life, it's only, only going to be found through the narrow gate the narrow gate. Interesting metaphor that Jesus used for those who want to find real life. Narrow gate means that you will not find the God kind of life unless you follow this closely defined path. You go through this narrow gate and follow this closely predetermined, predefined path, a, a simple way that God has ordained. It's simple. Even a child can understand it. We can't cry ignorance unless we really have some serious issues with our health and with our mental uh, capabilities. 
But there is this the narrow gate, Jesus said, that we must go through if we want life. Many of us have convinced ourselves that we can come to that gate and somehow maybe widen it a little bit, <laughs> you know, slip off maybe onto that wide path Jesus was talking about, going through that wide gate, that broad gate that leads to destruction and hopefully still find some sort of life. You know, we, we're good at compromising the eternal truths of God, whether we admit it or not. We all do. But we are the ones that will deceive ourselves if we think we can pull one over on God and still walk in his life. That's why Jesus made it clear that Following his single and narrow path will be difficult. That's the consequences of going through the narrow gate, following this predetermined, defined path, this way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth that leads to life. And to really do that, pursue that, and we're not talking about perfection, friends. We're talking about heartfelt, sincere pursuit. It's going to be difficult. The narrow gate is a hard way. It's a hard path. You see, there was a cost for Jesus to be the one that leads us to the life God intended for people. So there will be a cost for those that want to follow Jesus and find this life God intended for people. Jesus is telling us that to follow him in this world will be difficult. So because of that, there will only be a few, F-E-W, only a few that will believe the truths and build their life on the truth, on the rock, the rock of truth. So if you really believe the word of God and you have decided to follow Jesus, to be baptized into his death and be raised in baptism to start walking in newness of life, then here is what you should expect. I want to read some more words and sayings of Jesus. It's going to require you to listen very, very intently and very carefully to these few truths that I'm going to read concerning what it really means to follow Jesus, to find life, to walk through the narrow gate and follow the predetermined and defined path to life, Jesus. First Peter, Peter writes, For to this you have been called, Christian, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might now follow in his steps. Matthew writes in chapter 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me or obey me. John repeats this in his gospel. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In 1 John, the Apostle John writes, By this, by this, we know that we have come to know Jesus if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, well, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, 
and the truth is not in him. Matthew again, chapter 10, and you will be hated by everyone for my name's sake, but the one who endures unto the end shall be saved. John writes in his gospel, you are my friends, Jesus said, if you do what I command you. Jesus said, I am the vine in John 15. You, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in them, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, Christian, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. John writes in his gospel, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, my teachings, my sayings, if you live in them, you are truly my disciples, my students, my learners. And you will know the truth. And it will be that truth that will set you free. John 15, 8, by this my Father is glorified, said Jesus. Why? So that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Paul writes to a young man in 2 Timothy, named Timothy. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And finally, Paul writes to the Christians at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Therefore, Paul writes, I live my life by not running aimlessly without purpose, without pursuit, in other words. He goes, I do not fight the good fight of faith just like I'm beating in the air aimlessly. No, Paul said, I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now, I think we can assume after reading these words of truth that are in the Bible that God takes rejection of his truth very, very seriously. And it isn't because he's mean or domineering. Rather, he knows more than anyone that it is going to be his truth and his truth only that will set a person free, really free. I mean, the truth, the truth of God is the only prescription for rescue from the power of sin in this world and the power of death. Jesus spent his whole ministry speaking truth with authority to the people of Israel. And the most fascinating thing is the vast majority rejected it. So the $50,000 question is this. Are we Gentiles any different? Are we who profess allegiance to Jesus? Are we going to take the truths that Jesus taught seriously enough that we're willing to put our hand to the plow and not look back? No turning back. Or are we going to pick and choose 
the truths out of the Bible that fits our personal needs, our personal likes and dislikes, and that fits our way of living. You know, Jesus pronounces an unusual prophecy in Matthew chapter 21 to the people who have rejected God's truth. He says this, he goes, I, I say to you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but who, whomever the stone falls on, it will grind him to powder. Now keep in mind, Jesus is speaking to Israel, to the Jewish nation, his chosen people. Remember, Jesus came first to Israel, not to the Gentiles. Why? Because, as we have spoken in, in uh, messages in the past, Jesus, God the Father, had to clean his own house first. He had clean house. And that starts with his own people. Because how can they be a witness to the other nations of the world if their house is filthy? So God has to clean his house first. And that's what's going to happen on the great day of judgment. He's going to clean house with his people first. And then he'll turn to the world. It's important that we take his truths that are simple, that are relevant, that are easily understood as a whole, and follow them. Now, here's what Jesus is saying. God chose his son, Jesus, who was despised and rejected. He chose Jesus as the Messiah, the, the Christ the anointed one of God, to come and speak to his chosen people, Israel. God even prophesied it through the prophet Isaiah concerning Jesus being this stone that the builders ended up rejecting. In Isaiah 28, 16, God says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, in Israel, a tested stone. It's a true stone. It's, it's the real deal. It's, it's the Messiah. It's the Son of God. He's a precious cornerstone, and he is a sure foundation to build your life on. Isaiah 28, 16. Jesus himself told the people many times, come and follow me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the rock to build your house on. I am the defined path and the way to the living God. I am the eternal truth to build your life upon that will lead you straight to the life that God intended for his prized creatures, his humans who are created in his image, to have from the very beginning. There's only one result that is promised to an individual who will deny himself pick up his own cross and follow Jesus, obey him and his teachings of truth, and that is they will receive life, life eternal, which is God's state, blessed state of being. It's eternal, lasting life. Right now, outside of Jesus Christ, outside of following him, outside of obeying Jesus, if you are outside of, of a relationship knowing Jesus and him knowing you, then you are an enemy of your creator, even though he loves you and you are created in his image. There are times that following this way, this defined path, going through a, the narrow gate will be hard, Jesus said. It's not going to be easy all the time. It will require us if we're going to do that, to deny ourselves to the point that we are willing to suffer our rights to make sure that we stay in the will 
of God that's been ordained before the foundations of the world and receive his life. There are times it will require that we discipline our body, like Paul said, and make it our slave and not the other way around. We read earlier that Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He's simply saying, I'm the rock, guys. I'm the way to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And you can build your life on it. You can take it to the bank. Jesus has a warning against everyone or anyone who will oppose him or reject him. Don't reject Jesus. Don't reject his truths because things become a struggle, because it's not going the way you thought it should go, because sometimes it means you have to suffer in your belief and discipline your life, your body, to represent a real faith in God to the world around you. Apathy, pulling away from God, saying it doesn't work, taking the truths of Jesus lightly, is like standing in the way of a falling rock, Jesus said. It's terrifying to have a rock, a major big stone, to fall on you and grind you to powder. So don't reject. I'm here to do God's work, Jesus said. I'm the only foundation you can build life on and find life. It's unwise to oppose me, Jesus said, because God's work is not without consequence. Rejection of Jesus and, and his truths can be very fatal to a mere mortal. And unfortunately, many, many people reject Jesus. Oh, I don't. I love Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Do you obey him? If you don't, Jesus is going to be a stone that causes you to stumble. And in the end, it will crush you into powder. That's why Jesus said later on, as we read earlier today, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You know, friends, Jesus was fully aware. God, the Father, is fully aware that over the whole history of mankind, there have been religious leaders and teachers and prophets that would literally come and deceive people by making uh, by making false statements to make that other people feel better about living in their sin to to give them reason to continue in the path that they're on you know these kind of leaders will will say it's okay if you go a little bit outside of the will of god God, God's going to understand your disobedience. He'll still bless you in spite of your rebellion and, and stubborn hearts. You know, God speaks about this through his true prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 30. Listen to God speak to his children. He goes, ah, stubborn children, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out plans, but they're not mine and who make an allegiance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin upon sin upon sin, who set out to go down to Egypt, which is the world, without even asking for my direction. For they are a rebellious people, saith the Lord. They're lying children. They're children unwilling to hear the instructions of the Lord. And these people say to the prophets and the leaders, saying, don't prophesy to us what is right. Don't teach us what really the truth says, but speak to us smooth things, easy, peasy things, fun and exciting things, illusions, 
That's in Isaiah 30. And as you can see, this is nothing new than it's happening today. Today, we have worldly churches that rely on fun and excitement to draw people into a big building, use sweet and pleasant words who boast in their outrageous conduct using worldly songs in their gatherings, stage shows that would have been shocking to public decency only a few decades ago. They are unrestrained in their worship and lustful in their actions. And if you claim to follow Jesus and you persistently, persistently, day in it and day out practice what you know is not the will of God, you are in essence rejecting his truth and you are on very dangerous ground. You are flirting with God's judgment that's so going to be so severe that the only thing left that the stone is going to fall on you is will be the fact of, of, that you're ground to powder. The prophet Daniel gives a similar picture of the Messiah likening Jesus to a rock who was cut out, not by human hands, but he smashes into the nations of the world and obliterates them. Daniel 2.44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Well, what's that? It's the kingdom of God. God is going to set up a kingdom that will never, ever be destroyed and will last forever. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people who are rejecting Jesus, who are not obeying the truths of God. It, sh it shall break in pieces all these other kingdoms and bring them to an end. But that kingdom, the kingdom of God, will stand forever. Now, now, let's back up a minute. You go, this is just as about as harsh as a per person can get, uh, you know, in, in, in preaching or teaching a message. I believe 110% the apostle what the apostle John wrote about Jesus the son of God that he came to earth full of grace and full of truth thank God almighty for his grace but what happens is Dear ones, listen. I liken God's grace, which is wonderful. We have to have it if we're going to walk in the truth. We have to have some grace from God, some some mercy, some some room to learn and to grow and to for him to form us and conform us to the image of Jesus, and that's a lifetime journey, right? Thank God for his grace. But I liken God's grace to a rubber band as a metaphor that, that, that stretches, okay, as we pursue to follow Jesus, to, to know Jesus. It gives us room to grow in wisdom and strength and understanding of how to walk worthy of his call on our life. He's called us to be his children, his own, his own beloved. And he has given us life. And he, he's, he, he, if we will just obey him and learn to follow him for all it's worth, follow that truth that's immovable and enduring rock, build our life on it, knowing that it cannot fail in providing a real solid foundation that has the consequences of eternal life, eternal truth of lasting life. But if we persist in willful practice in our daily living of what God calls wrongdoing, and we, we know that and we understand that, and we know what God calls wrong and unacceptable in his sight and according to his will. That rubber band of God's grace can be stretched 
and stretched, we can go from that grace helping us to grow and to be more obedient and 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 sincere in our faith to we're, we're using that gut we're, we're taking advantage of God's grace we're stretching it because we we persist and insist on living in known and willful sin and so at some point that rubber band's going to break and the consequences will be we will fall on the rock of truth and be broken Now, knowing this, is it any wonder can we question why Jesus would give the best advice we could ever receive if we want want to follow him in Luke 14? Jesus said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my student, my learner, my disciple. You know, living in that grace, that beautiful grace of God, learning and growing spiritually. And then Jesus says, let me ask you a question. Which of you, if you desire to build a tower, that you don't just first sit down and count the cost? Do I have enough to complete it? Am I willing? Am I willing to struggle, to suffer, to get to do whatever it takes to discipline myself to know Christ for all it's worth, to bear my own cross and come after Jesus and follow him and learn to obey him and be his disciple, his learner, his student, do I have enough? Is this is what I'm doing really real? Am I really sincere about it? Or are these just good intentions? Or I'm just going through a really bad time right now and you know I need God's blessings. Am I just doing it to get something? Or am I doing it to know someone? And so Jesus said, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, get that calculator out, whether he has enough to complete that job of building a tower. Otherwise, Jesus said, when he lays the foundation, you know, he's got enough money to do that, but he's not able to finish it. Uh, it didn't work following God. It didn't work for me. I, you know, I saw the other day on social media, I saw somebody said, today I got baptized. And and somebody commented underneath it and said, yeah, I did that once, but it didn't work for me. Okay, well, obviously you didn't count the cost. Because Jesus said, those that don't finish what they start, those that don't put their hand to the plow and never look back, or keep looking back, rather, people get to looking at them and say, mocking him, saying, this man began to build, but he wasn't able to finish. You know, this man was uh, uh, said, God, be, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then a week later, he's back doing living life the way he's always lived it. You know, accepting the call of God to come and follow Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It's going to be difficult. It's a narrow gate. It's a predetermined, predefined path that you have to follow. He'll give you grace to learn, but the truth will crush you if you don't obey it. The way and the truth of Jesus must be considered with a sober and authentic heart and a mind and sincerity of faith, a humble heart. All the consequences must be thought through thoroughly and settled in our own heart that when we put our hand to that plow and start following Christ, we are not going to look back despite what may come my way. Because I'm already been told that it's going to be difficult. 
that it's not going to be easy. But boy, the reward, there's no comparison for its life, lasting life, eternal life. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now what? Well, the answer to that is there's no turning back. We're going to end it there today, dear friends. I think I've given you a lot to uh, think about and uh, chew on. Uh, I would encourage you to get alone with the Lord and, and, uh, Get the get the word of God out, the word of truth, and 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 think about these things, and and uh, and examine your own heart, examine your own heart, your own life. Ask yourself: Do you have enough to finish? Did I count the cost? What it really means to follow Jesus. Till next time, may the Lord bless you, and open your eyes of understanding, and enrich you with His Son Jesus.